Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Acts chapter 8, we're going to be learning about a man named Philip. And Philip is called an evangelist, but that's because of the work he does in Samaria. Before Philip was given this title, though, he was known as a man full of faith and the Spirit, actively serving at the benevolent tables and was one of the seven from Acts chapter six. So Luke is beginning to focus on key figures. But I want you to note something. He was called an evangelist because of the work he did, but he was an ordinary man just like you men and ladies. He was an ordinary person, right? He was not necessarily an evangelist yet until he went and obeyed the Lord and did what he needed to do. But you ready for this? He went to Samaria because of persecution in Jerusalem. So we learned last week that uh, Stephen was stoned, right? And so the church begins to spread. So he goes as a man full of faith in the spirit. And we're gonna read today that God uses him to evangelize in Samaria. But I want you to understand that that could be any of us, that God uh, sends us somewhere and he uses us to evangelize. Are you following me on that? And, and now, is there, a, is there an office of the church? Is there, a, is there a leadership office of the church of evangelists? Yes. And uh, some would say that obviously Philip was an evangelist office of the church. But before that, he was a man who served the Lord at a benevolence table. So it seems like God is just expanding his influence and his ministry. So let's get into it. I'll teach a little bit, read some more, teach a little bit, and we'll keep going through. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. <clears throat> a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. Wow. So we're actually getting a little bit about Saul here, and we're going to read about him in Acts chapter 9. And Saul was there uh, condoning and okay with the stoning of Stephen. And we only know that from the, the previous chapter that he held the coats of those who were stoning. Now we're seeing that he gets into the, in, the more intense into the persecution of the church. And in the Greek here, he was very angry and the words that are used are havoc. He was call, causing havoc for the church. He was wanting men and women to be imprisoned and sentenced to death. As we learn later on in Acts, he'll say that. So he was serious, uh, he was a serious persecutor of the church, and we're going to read later on how God changes his life. Isn't that cool? But right now what we see here is the church is being scattered, and it says the apostles stay in Jerusalem, and they continue to lead the church at the hub there. Now, when it says all believers left, it didn't mean that every single believer left, but many believers left here, and they went to Judea, Samaria. And so we see Philip as one of those believers who goes to Samaria because of the persecution. And let's pick up in verse four. Oh, and I'm sorry, let me explain something to you as well. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. That was actually referring to um, Jewish men who weren't in agreement with the stoning of Stephen. And so uh, they may not have been believers, but they were devout men of the Jewish faith and they did not agree with the killing of Stephen, so they took, they took his body for that occasion. Now verse four says, but the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus everywhere they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed, so there was great joy in that city. 
So we see that Philip takes the gospel to Samaria, and as he preaches and as he shares the gospel and he, he, he talks about the gospel to these people, he begins to actually cast out demons in the crowds and he begins to do uh, healings. And what's happening here is this work, this manifestations of the spirit through the healings or casting out demons was confirming the gospel. And remember I taught uh, in previous chapters that works would accompany the gospel preaching. And sometimes works is what gave the apostles opportunities to actually preach the gospel when they did miracles, signs, and wonders. And in this case, Philip is able to cast out demons and he's also able to perform miracles uh, with healing those who were lame or paralyzed in his presence. And so what do you think is going to happen when people see this? They're going to start telling everyone. They're going to start telling everyone about this. And they're going to go, wow, this, this man, he's, he's preaching this message and he's healing people and, he's, and we're seeing demons come out of people. And so now crowds are coming around him and the crowd is getting larger, most likely. And then there's great joy in the city. You know why? Where there's liberation, there's joy. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so great joy is taking place in the city. The gospel is advancing in Samaria. I'll get more into that in, my, in our application of what, how significant that is. But there was someone watching, and his name is Simon. Let's read about this man. We have this shadowy character in this story here. An interesting man that we're going to learn about. A man, verse 9, named Simon, had been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as, quote unquote, the great one, the power of God. They listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. Now, just for a moment, let me share a little bit about this. There are different views of his, uh, his level of sorcery, but it is plain and simple in Scripture that he practiced magic and he practiced sorcery. Now, some commentators would say that he performed tricks and he was deceiving people with his tricks. Um, and some commentators say that he actually had demonic powers that he was using to do these things. I would say either way, what he was doing was not of God, amen? Because if it was deceptive tricks and, and illusions and such that he was doing for his own gain and being worshiped and glorified as being the great one or the power of God, he did it for himself and, uh, and most likely a money-making career as well. Um, but he was practicing something demonic in some way, shape, or form. I lean into he was practicing something demonic. And I do believe, though, that sometimes people do just play tricks and deceive people as well. So instead of either or, how about both and? That's a safe bet. And, but it's important that we understand that there is demonic influence in our world. Do you, you, know, you believe that, right? And that the devil will use people to do his work as well. And so Simon the sorcerer got his reputation because he practiced sorcery. So I think we need to go ahead and, and deduce from this and basically uh, believe that he was practicing magic and most likely evil or dark magic. But he, then he encounters Philip. And verse 12 says, but now the people believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God. So they weren't just believing that God can do miracles. They were believing in the good news of the kingdom of God. So they were listening to his message and they were believing the message too, not just liking the miracles. That's important. And then he goes on to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, all these, the message of Jesus Christ and the works of Jesus Christ, and as a result, many men and women were baptized. He's referring to water baptism. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went, 
and he was amazed by the signs and great miracles Philip performed. So he was amazed by these signs and miracles and he witnessed these things. And so he put his faith in Jesus and was also water baptized. Um, But I'm gonna tackle a tough question after we see what comes next, all right? Verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. And as soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. Wow, this is a really interesting moment here. Some people call this the Samaritan Pentecost because it's very similar to the Pentecost of the Jews in Acts chapter 2. The the apostles were most likely sent to Samaria to confirm that the message had now spread to Samaria and it wasn't just in Jerusalem. And also to encourage the new believers and as well as Philip. But upon arrival, they learned that the people had believed and were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Notice in the name of Jesus Christ, not John's baptism, but salvation in Jesus and baptism in Jesus but they had not received the gift of the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues is what's implied here. That is, the Spirit had not fallen on any of them in the way he had fallen on the believers on the day of Pentecost. So the apostles had this experience in Acts 2. And then they were filled again in Acts 4 when they were in the house praying together. So they were refilled again with the Holy Spirit. And so they believed that after salvation or around salvation, that believers should be filled with the Holy Spirit to be powerful witnesses and to help them be a a testimony to those around them of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when they got there, they had found that they had believed and were water baptized, but had not been baptized in the Spirit or filled with the Spirit or received the Holy Spirit. And those three sentences in the book of Acts refer to the gift that Jesus promised that he would send to us to help us be witnesses. And so that had not happened yet. And so what they did was they placed their hands on them and they prayed for them. And just so you know, just a note, that's not necessarily a formula because no one placed their hands on them in Acts chapter two. So it it may have happened here as more of an approval or a sign that now even the Samaritans are part of the church of Jesus Christ, but it's not meant to be a formula that in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, someone must place their hand on you and pray for you. The Holy Spirit can fill you right now with no one praying and putting their hands on you. Actually, that's my personal experience as well. No one placed their hand on me. Now, after salvation is the blessing of being filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is for personal edification and power to be witnesses for the Lord. And let me read to you a a quote from the Fire Bible. Just as baptism in water is an outward testimony of what has taken place inwardly through salvation... So baptism in the Spirit provides outwardly evidence of the Spirit's powerful presence flowing through a believer's life. God's Spirit already lives within and directs Christians' lives from the point of salvation. So you have the Holy Spirit of salvation. Yet baptism in the Spirit is vital for experiencing God's full power and purpose for our lives. So in a sense, salvation puts the Holy Spirit's Spirit into people, and then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which helps bring the Spirit out through us or through them in powerful ways. I wanted to help you understand that because there is the gift of salvation, but then Jesus talks about this other gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit that he was going to send. Why? So you would be witnesses. You would have power to be my witnesses. And so a lot of us may not have been raised in a denomination or a circle that taught this, that taught that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit uh, for power and with power to help you follow Jesus, to help you do his works, to help you use your gifts, to give you power. And what's the purpose? Is the purpose for self-glorification? Absolutely not. The purpose is for you to bring glory to God. A very big opposite of what Simon is about to show us here. 
in Simon's life was he wanted everyone to look at him and worship him. The gift of the power of the Holy Spirit is for us to help people worship Jesus. But it's a gift. And I want to apply that more as we get to the end. I do want to note this as well, that they did not come and pray for their salvation. The apostles did not come and say, let's pray for your salvation. They already believed they were saved. They believed that Philip would not process this without understanding that they had believed and were saved. So when they came, they didn't say, let's pray for your salvation. When they came, let's say, they said, let's pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, let's look at what happens next. Because we, we want to know, you know, how do you know someone's been filled with the Holy Spirit? How do you know someone's been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Now, in Acts 2, what was the initial physical sign that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit? They spoke or prayed in other tongues, in other languages. Now, in this one, Luke actually does not express or say anything or any sign of what they did. And so, you know, how do we handle that? But someone noticed something, and it was Simon. Verse 18, if you bring that up on the screen again. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Oop, uh uh-oh. Oh, boy. This is where it gets, this, this isn't good. What did Simon see? What did Simon hear? What was the experience? See, I believe that something happened a powerful encounter or experience happened and Simon saw it and then of course now his heart is truly exposed and now he wants that power and he's willing to pay for it and he doesn't realize it's actually a gift from God. And you can't buy salvation and you can't buy the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift that the Lord gives you when we open our hearts to receive, okay? And so let me just give you a little biblical um, context on this. Why doesn't Luke include that they spoke in tongues? Because that is the initial sign. Why wouldn't he just say they spoke in tongues here? Luke often, and I quote this from Stanley Horton's book, um, Acts, on page 166, Luke often does not explain everything when it is clear elsewhere. For example, he does not mention water baptism every time he tells about people believing or being added to the church. However, it is clear that the failure to mention water baptism is not significant. Other places show that all believers were baptized in water. So there are times where he doesn't say people were baptized in water, but we all know that the church practiced this. They were committed to this practice, because especially because Jesus Uh, commanded them to, and so it didn't mean that they did not water baptize them, and it's the same thing here, that Luke didn't always mention everything in detail about everything that happened. And then when Simon saw that the Spirit was given, you you got to wonder, what did he see? But he saw that there was a laying on of the hands, and so we see that he is watching this happen, and perhaps he's not being filled. (laughs) <laughs> let, me, let me keep reading this for you so we, so we have the whole context. Verse 19, he says this, let me have this power too so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. Aren't you cringing just a little bit when you read that? But Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought You can have no part in this, for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts, for I can see. So Peter is discerning in the spirit, and Peter is probably having a either discernment or a word of knowledge and understanding, a divine insight into his heart. This has happened to me as well at times. You can get a divine insight of what people's heart or motives are, and that does not happen regularly, let me tell you. That is not a regular thing. But in this moment, to preserve the church, the Holy Spirit is helping Peter discern this. Now, it doesn't take much to discern that either, does it? He's asking for money. So this is a theological concern. 
But Peter goes beyond that, or he's asking to pay for the, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you get that physical concern that you can see, but then Peter goes further to say, your heart is not right. So he's going even deeper here, okay? And he says this, perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts, for I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. When Simon saw that Peter was given on the laying of the hands, he did not come to receive himself. Instead, he fell back into his old thinking and desire for self-glorification. That's what's going on. Remember that everyone followed him. He was the great one, the power of God. You know, he was the, 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 the person that everyone wanted to, to come to for help or whatever it may be where he practiced his sorcery. And now no one's coming to him because everyone's going to Philip. And so he, he reverts back to this old way of thinking and it doesn't show us that he actually was filled with the Holy Spirit here. He was not necessarily one of the ones that was filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Luke does detail this. He was watching and immediately wanted what the apostles had. Now notice he wanted what the apostles had. He wanted to be like this leader again right away. When he is a newborn, or at least he appears to be a newborn believer, and all of a sudden he wants to skip all these, all these learning lessons, all this discipleship, he doesn't even realize that you're called to be in leadership like this. He wants to skip all of that and get back his influence so he can be glorified again. Are you seeing what Peter's seeing here? Now we see it because Peter exposed it, but Peter had to discern that in the moment with the help of the Holy Spirit. It's a pretty powerful moment, isn't it? A valid question is brought up in this whole scripture here. Was Simon truly saved? Oh my goodness, you should see all the articles on this. Whoo, there is a lot, of, a lot of thoughts on this. I'll tell you where I, where I camp out at. I camp out that he wasn't. I camp out that he wasn't. However, that would mean that Philip water baptized a person who wasn't truly saved. And that could happen. That, that could happen because Philip's new to the ministry. He's, he's still learning how to do all this. And so it could happen that he, he did that. But let me, let me also share with you, Stanley Horton says this, some have questioned whether Simon truly believed, but the Bible says he did and does not qualify the statement in any way. Moreover, Philip, a man led by the Spirit, surely would not have baptized him if he had not been given evidence of being a true believer. But again, we can make mistakes. So I don't know where I stand with Stanley on that. No pun intended. <laughs> the Full Life Bible Commentary, the one I use very often, says the verb believe, or in the Greek pisteo, is used for the faith of both Simon and the Samaritans. But Simon's subsequent behavior reveals he remains in bondage to his sins, unregenerated. He is still full of bitterness and captive to sin and tries to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit. His faith is superficial, resting apparently on miracles alone. He has failed to experience genuine repentance and lacks a real spiritual understanding of the gospel. That's more where I lean. Now, another commentator goes further and says, Luke never stated that Simon received the Holy Spirit. Simon continued to have a self-centered interest in the display of miraculous power. And the verb repent here used in verse 22 is normally addressed to lost people. So when Peter said repent, it was like he was saying, you're lost, you're not saved. So that's important we understand the Greek understandings here. And the word perish employed in verse 20 is strong, is related to the word perish in John 3, 16, that none shall perish but have everlasting life. So he is on his way to perishing because he doesn't have Jesus. And the description of Simon in Acts 8, 23 is a better description of a lost man than those who has been saved, which is true. He is displaying, in other words, that he is not saved. You could say, maybe he's a brand new believer and he needed the strong rebuke and be discipled in this moment. We could say that, that might be the middle ground. But I would say he is not showing sign of true repentance and true salvation, okay? Now here's the thing, should we be dogmatic on that? Should we, should we try to play God and be judge? 
Nah. <laughs> but can we discern by fruit? And can we discern through the Holy Spirit? Yes. And that's what Peter's doing here. And I would trust Peter in what he's trying to say here. Okay? And he does say, what Peter does say is that there's forgiveness because he says repent. He says repent. So let's, let's keep going. Uh, verse 20, 23 I'm sorry, verse 24, Simon says this, pray to the Lord for me. Now, I would, so just so you know, I think Peter wanted him to pray. You know, repent. So again, this is a a man who doesn't understand yet. All right? Pray to the Lord for me, Simon exclaimed, that these terrible things you've said won't happen to me. So we, Peter is saying repent earlier on, and so he's saying you can be forgiven, but you need to turn away from this sin and this way of thinking. You need a come to Jesus moment again, all right? But I believe that Simon reveals where his heart truly is. Perhaps Peter discerned jealousy and sinful motives in Simon about this following of Philip and the gospel. And again, Peter's having this discernment and knowledge operating these gifts to help us and to help him, to help us understand, but to help Simon most of all. But this encounter with Simon serves as a warning to those who wish to have power and position and self-exaltation. It's a warning, isn't it? In verse 25, we end this portion of scripture for today. After testifying and preaching the word of the Lord in Samaria, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem And they stopped in many Samaritan villages along the way to preach the good news. So there was favor there. There was, they were having success there. The Lord was working powerfully. And so just so you know, though, that there had to be this moment where the, even the apostles had to come and see, oh, wow, the gospel really is going out to the outer parts of the earth, not just in Jerusalem. So they came for themselves to see. And when they came, they found that the Holy Spirit, they had not been baptized in the Holy Spirit yet. Um, Peter deals with some discipline and some rebuking of Simon the sorcerer. And guess what? The gospel thrives because of that too. And the gospel thrives because of all the work that's taking place. And by the way, Philip was working a benevolence table but because of persecution, he departed, and now God's using him powerfully. Do you know God can use you too? Let's get to our takeaways today. Number one, God has unique ways of fulfilling his plans, doesn't he? God has unique ways of fulfilling his plans. God used this persecution to start the great missionary work of the church and fulfill Acts 1.8. Check out this this scripture, Acts chapter one, verse eight but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You can go to the next slide for me if you don't mind so they can see that for themselves. Jesus said this. Jesus was saying, wait for me, wait, wait, for, or wait for the Holy Spirit to come, Okay, wait in Jerusalem. You will receive power. I'm going to send my spirit. You will receive power to be my witnesses. And it would spread. And here we have it. Now Luke is starting to show that the gospel is spreading not just in Jerusalem, but outside to Samaria as well. Do we understand that Samaritans and Jews were not friends? (laughs) There's a lot of things I could go into that for today, but because of time, I won't. But just remember how in the Gospels, they didn't get along. Do you remember the time where the Samaritan village wasn't welcoming Jesus and his followers? And so James and John said, let's call down fire on them. Oh, hey, take it easy, James and John. They they were nearsighted. They weren't thinking about the long view that Jesus had that that the Gospel was going to get to these people. Let's not burn down these villages, okay? A little, a little rash there on that. Yeah, but their zeal was, was there, but it was wrong, you know. This is the, the fulfillment of the gospel spreading. This scripture, though, reminds me of John 12, 24. 
I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. So that was referring to Jesus' death when he dies. A great harvest would come out of his death because he would rise again. But the same thing with Stephen. Stephen dies and now people are persecuted and they spread out and now a great harvest is taking place. It's powerful. So the, the last point to this point, to God has unique ways of filling his plans, I would say this, don't despise or humanize your tri- trials. Don't despise or humanize your trials. God could be utilizing a trial to work and accomplish his divine will for you and others. That's probably hard to see in the moment when you're going through hard times. It is. I've been there. But it's in hindsight I realize that God was using that trial to do something for his will and purposes in my life or in other people's lives. So do not despise or humanize, let's keep the trials possibly divine. Are you following me here? That might be a new one you haven't heard recently. But I've seen God divinely work through my trials and struggles, through other people's trials and struggles to set something up for his gospel to spread, for his good news to be spoken to those around us. Secondly, God's favorite vehicle to spread the gospel is through people saved by the gospel. We see Philip saved by the gospel and he goes and shares the gospel because Philip is gonna go and share the gospel wherever he goes. God's favorite vehicle for sharing the gospel is you and me. His means to get the gospel out has been through us. That's why he said, you will receive power to be my witnesses. And that promise is for us as well. And the the book of Acts shows us this obvious truth. It is the acts of the spirit through his people that the gospel spreads from Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. You are God's favorite vehicle to spread the gospel. Now you're not Jesus, okay? And neither am I. Notice I'm saying to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, not to spread, you know, your thoughts or your teachings or things like that. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit is essential for empowering believers to advance the gospel. We are seeing in this story that the Holy Spirit is essential for for, uh, empowering believers like Philip to advance the gospel. The Holy Spirit works through us to perform miracles. Proclaim the gospel with authority and give us discernment and victory in spiritual warfare. What we see here is that God took an ordinary man like Philip to do extraordinary things through the power of the Holy Spirit. Working miracles is for believers to do. Obviously, God is the miracle worker, right? through us, but all of us can work miracles. All of us can perform miracles or at least pray for them, believe for them, and see them done. I believe that today, it wasn't just for the apostles, it was for today. Notice that Philip was not an apostle. He was like one of us. He did not have necessarily the apostle role. Because some people teach that only the apostles could do these things. And I'm baffled to think how even Philip himself, who was working a benevolent table at one point and now is in Samaria, is now working miracles. Why? Because it's God working through us. That's the most important thing. Secondly, proclaiming the gospels for all believers. Philip wasn't formally sent to do missionary work. He was not sent. We don't have any evidence that he was sent to Samaria to do evangelism. He was simply evading persecution. He was trying to dodge the persecution, and it was okay that he was, because everyone, everyone was going to do that, and the church stayed in Jerusalem. The apostles stayed there. 
Perhaps maybe they did send them out, but he was never placed, he never had hands placed on him and said, now go and preach the gospel there. Go to Samaria strategically and do all this. We have no evidence of that. It would be like one of us leaving Delaware, moving to another state, and God uses you to spread the gospel there. It was as simple as that. We are also equipped to share the gospel with other people. You're a missionary if you're willing to be on mission wherever you go. Do you agree with that? You may not feel like you're worthy to be one. You may feel like you're not fully capable of being one. But the reality is, with God's help, you can be one. And it starts with loving people, right? It starts with shining the light of Jesus. You don't have to be like this bona fide, you know, titled missionary that's sent by some organization to do missional work in your community. Okay? It's for all believers. And lastly here, victory in spiritual warfare is for all believers. God promised that we would have victory over darkness. He even gave us armor to actually fight against it defensively. That the church would prevail. The gates of hell would not prevail. As we advance the gospel, the gates of hell would not be able to stop us from coming in and breaking through the darkness and preaching and sharing the love and the light and the truth of Jesus Christ. The world is hungry for the spiritual and supernatural. Did you know that? Have you seen it? How, how much people want to, to be spiritual? How billions of people practice some form of spirituality and then people practice magic and get into the occult. And that's not for us believers, amen? The Bible actually condemns it. Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12 says this, for example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering and do not let your people practice fortune telling. Don't you dare go to a fortune teller. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Do not try to be like that and do not go to people like that. That's of the devil. The Bible is clear. He condemns it. And just so you know, there is a rise in this. My sister-in-law sent me, I couldn't believe it. I'm even nervous to even say it because I don't want people to even, uh, just don't, don't, do not go to Amazon and buy this. I will come to your house, I'll rip it out of your house and I'll burn it. <laughs> but someone made a spirit Ouija board. Because we're, we're, we're not, we're not trying to be with the Lord and receive his spirit's help and guidance. We want to do it the way we want to do it. And so now we have people creating products, false believers it looks like, about the Holy Spirit guiding you with letters on a board and you put your hand on this thing. I cannot believe I, this is a product. It's nuts. So just so you know, it's a real issue in our, in our world right now, and you probably heard it. Verse 12 says, anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these detestable things that the Lord your God would drive them out ahead of you. Now, I wanna say this, the Holy Spirit is given to empower believers to help lead those in darkness to salvation in Christ and to bring glory to God. The reason why I don't believe Simon was a true believer is because Simon wanted power for himself, not Jesus. Notice he wanted power more than he wanted Jesus in that story. It wasn't about Jesus. It wasn't about receiving the Holy Spirit. Right away, he wanted power because he saw them lay hands and he said, I want that power. And let me tell you something, as Christians, we can be tempted to want power for our own glory. You better be careful with that. It's a fearful, trembling thing to be used by the Holy Spirit. It is not for your glory, it's for the glory of God. Amen. 
we would be wise to check our hearts on that too. Lord, I, I want the, this, I mean, this could be the heart, unfortunately. Lord, give me your Holy Spirit. Baptize me in the Spirit so I could heal people. Why? I'm going to ask you why. Why? What's your reason? Because there's many times where it's about what we, what we can get out of it. And we're seeing that on YouTube. We're seeing that online where it just seems to be a ministry about this person, not a ministry of Jesus Christ. Look out for that and don't you dare ever pay for any kind of miracle. Freely we received, freely we give. Don't you dare ever pay for something like that. My goodness. That, that just ticks me off when I see that. Mm. Okay, all right, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling better. <laughs> feeling better now. Feeling better now. But this is real stuff. Spiritual warfare. But we have victory because of the Holy Spirit with us, help us. The Holy Spirit gave Peter discernment and most likely, I believe, a word of knowledge into his heart. Divine insight. You know that God has done that for me. God will do that for you when you need it for whatever occasion it may be. This is, this is, what, it, this is what it looks like to spread the gospel. Okay, now there's other, there's other ways to do it. But when you go to dark places that don't know the gospel, this is what's gonna happen. But some of you might be saying, well, darkness is in my own home. You know what? You're probably right. From the conversations I've had with people, you're probably right. Whether it's your children, your spouses, whatever, darkness could be in your home. But let me ask you something. What are you doing about that? What are we doing about that? Are we just coming to church and going, you know, oh man, that felt good. Are we gonna get on our knees with the Lord on a regular basis in our home and pray over our homes. And by the way, you have authority to do that. You don't need to call every pastor to come to your house. Because I ain't trying to get, just load up my schedule with a bunch of house visits like that. Okay, the same spirit that lives in me lives in you. Okay? Praise the Lord. All right? Now listen. There is darkness all around us. And we're walking around without the help of the Holy Spirit because we think we can do it all on our own. I'm not trying to like just, I'm not trying to judge you right now. I'm, not, I'm just saying I've seen way too many churches or people of God trying to use human initiative and intuitive uh, thinking to figure things out. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's by the Holy Spirit. So we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us. And so let me, let me get to that, the last point. The last point. This is, this is interesting. This, I feel like God really pressed this on my heart. Because we've been reading about a man full of the Holy Spirit and faith, because that same title was given to Philip as well, not just Stephen. All these men that were, the, the seven men of Acts 6, they were, they were people full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And this was a man who was evading persecution and God used him to spread the gospel. God has you in where you are working right now for a reason, okay? And then when you're sharing the gospel, people are gonna get saved, but then people like Simons are gonna be around you. What are you gonna do about it, okay? And then on top of that, we see that the apostles go, these believers need the power of the Holy Spirit. We do too. Why was it essential for the church back then to have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit so much so that when the apostles arrived, they bring that up? That's important because they're gonna, you're gonna face things like this and all of us should spread the gospel and all of us are gonna face spiritual warfare. So I got, I got one more point for you. And I really feel like I've even had conversations with a brother in Christ about this recently. I've had conversations with others. I am sensing the same thing. So lastly, well, I've really built this up. This better be a good one, right? <laughs> Have childlike faith in God for miracles and baptism in the Holy Spirit. What do I mean by that? Sometimes bad experiences train us 
or simply fear makes us overly critical or cynical about how or when miracles can happen. I'll, I'll be honest, I'm being transparent before this body of Christ today that even I have wondered the how instead of remembering the who. Who I'm praying to for a miracle. Or who wants to fill me? The Holy Spirit. And by the way, Jesus wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he is the baptizer according to scripture. He's going to baptize us in the spirit. So his authority is on being baptized in the spirit. And yes, and yes, one of the initial physical signs is definitely praying in tongues. And I know that can be scary or that can sound intimidating or that can sound strange because you're not used to it. And that's what I'm saying. We have to have childlike faith that these gifts are for us today and that God still does miracles today. To believe, to not try to figure it all out before it happens or to not be so bothered by what's gonna happen if I get filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not about the experience. It's about the person of the Holy Spirit coming in you to help you. Now, do I mean check your brains out the door, check your discernment out the door, at the door and don't have any? No, I'm not saying that. Am I saying to be immature faith? No. I'm saying have childlike faith that trusts the Lord at his word, just like a child would trust his father. Hopefully, hopefully in the real world, we can trust our fathers, right? I get it. Maybe we've been through some things with our fathers that we can't take his word for it. But let me tell you something. You can take God's word for it. He still wants to perform miracles. He's still baptizing people in the Holy Spirit. And I think sometimes we can be so critical, over analytical. I'm like that. I analyze so much. Oh my goodness. And, and we're just, and he's just like, hey, God's like, I have this gift. I, I, you, know, you know what I wonder? I wonder if God's up in heaven sometimes going, can you stop overthinking it? I'm trying to give you this gift. <laughs> I'm trying to do that miracle. Would you just step out in faith and pray for that miracle? Because I'm trying to do it, but you're not asking you're doubting and questioning everything before you ever even ask. I wonder if God's up in heaven saying that right now. I don't know. All right, let's pray. Why don't we stand together? <laughs> Have childlike faith. Why? If we did have childlike faith, maybe we wouldn't get hung up on the divine or supernatural experience of these things and they would be at peace with his spirit working and praying through us, I think we would experience more of what Acts Church experienced if we had childlike faith. I just, I read the story of Philip, and I know Luke does not give us all the details in Acts. I get that. But I read this, and I go, Philip just went to Samaria, and God, and he believed God was gonna do this stuff. And I just wonder if we're holding back, we're, we're not experiencing this and we just got to start to have that faith in God again that innocent childlike faith again to trust him at his word that's what I'm trying to say so can we just pray we ask for that and and let me tell you on Wednesday night at our prayer meeting we're going to focus on that the Lord already told me focus on that let's come to pray for miracles let's come to pray for the help of the Holy Spirit to fill us because the time is short and people are coming to the church and people are looking for answers and you're gonna go as the church outside the walls and you're gonna need help, just like me. And you know what, we have it. Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit to help us. Lord, we open our hearts, Lord, to trust you once again. Thank you for this scripture today to encourage us Help us to understand it. Help us to not overanalyze or be overly critical of everything, God, and to be like a child again who just trusts you at your word. When you say, take, take your hand, we take your hand and we follow you. And I just pray you would help us to be like that, Lord. And Lord, for those experiences we've had that have hurt us or maybe made us fearful of it, Lord, I, I just pray you would heal those. And we would understand that that's not your will for us to be hurt by the misuse of gifts of the Spirit or 
the false, you know, confirmations of healings and they never came. All those things that can make us not believe or question and doubt. Lord, I pray that we would come back to you more, more importantly and what your word shows us and what you've taught. Lord, empower us through your Holy Spirit. Give us the faith to believe for miracles. Help us to live on mission today and wherever we go this week. And Lord, help us to fight in spiritual warfare with your weapons, Lord, with your spiritual gifts, with prayer, with our armor, according to Ephesians 6. Help us to live on mission, and I know you'll be with us. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for this church, Lord, and the extra time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.